This is why I told people that we should tell everyone it starts at noon and not 12.30 because now we're running late. So that, that's, that's, no we got to that. How does that make you feel? Good <laughs> Do you two both We do, yeah. Yeah. She's like this all the time. It's on top of you. Yeah, I mean, she has to get done. She has to get done, right? Yeah, I'll say. No, no, I'm waiting on all of you. That's what's happening right now. I don't know if everyone knows that you're waiting on them, though. I think you're right. Yeah, if only we could make an announcement or something. Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? Do it very violently. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to everyone to Mount Island Communication. Let's have everybody move forward a little bit. Yeah. Come get friendly. You can cuddle with some dogs. Bring it on in. You hear for the I know we had some oatmeal that was put together last minute by uh, Kristen and some other people in the what house. Was the plan? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we get we've made it work together at the last minute. That's great. Glad to see that that is being offered to people. Glad to see. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm facilitating the presentation now. Um, is, that, is everyone, Kristen? Are you done over there? Can you? I'm getting there. Okay. Sorry. We're just all waiting for you. So yeah. You know how it is. <laughs> okay, you're just going to stare blankly that whole time? Are you? Okay. Very good. Claire, you look comfy. You got everything you need. Great. So glad. Six drinks. Yeah. <laughs> Just make yourself, just you know, kick your feet up. My yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got we got a, some spare seat over here. Anyone want? Excellent. Everyone quite done. Are we done with the side talk? Um, okay. If it needs to be for you. Yeah, I, I, it will at some point. I, if you need more time, I can. Okay. Glad to hear. So, are you quite done? Thank you. And scene. <laughs> this is Kristen. Kristen and I. Uh, we don't usually communicate like this. Yeah. So, that was. Uh, the, that was a model of what we're not going to be discussing, which is what we are discussing is not about the communication. I'm interested in how people would describe the communication we were using with Passive each other. Aggressive. Passive aggressive. Okay. Anything else? What other words might you use to describe? Regular aggressive. Regular aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Passive went right out the window and it just went. Aggressive. Anything else? She's a little self-centered. Self-centered. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, how do people feel? Anxious. Anxious, yeah. Uncomfortable. Uh-huh. Totally. Like, are you teaching this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this fucking person supposed to teach me not my <laughs> Initially very confused about your change of personality. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, uh, disoriented. Disoriented, totally. Because you were entering a space that you were anticipating was going to be held by someone, me, or other people, and then you see that that space was not being held. So now you need to find your own orientation. Yeah. Any other feelings? Disappointed. Disappointed, yeah. Because <laughs> you're excited. You, you yeah. want to learn some skills. You want to see some, you want to put this to use so that you can better contribute to yours and other lives. Totally. Yeah. Um, this might be new language for people, but uh, what needs came up? Do people resonate with that language at all? Mm -hmm. Need for safety. Need for safety. Awesome. That's a great need. Needs yeah. for punctuality. 
Punctuality, yeah. totally. Needs Thank you. Quiet. Quiet, yeah. <laughs> some space, some focus, yeah. Totally. Excellent. Yes? I would say needs to compromise and get on the same page. Totally, yeah. As far, yeah, totally. With us, right? What I needed, I had needs like uh, efficiency and to be heard, and I'm sure you had similar needs. Well, totally. Awesome. Um, one question I have for y'all was the, uh, the interaction that we had was that, uh, never mind our acting, but was it common or realistic or is that, is that something you see often? Yeah. Um, okay, the big question, would you describe it as violent? Mm -hmm. interaction? Yeah. You would? Mm -hmm. I saw, I heard some no's. Some people say yes. What, what, why would it be violent that people say yes, it is violent? Um, I experienced it was like you guys were throwing daggers at each other. Okay, yeah. There was a lot of blame. There was no responsibility, no ownership. Okay, totally. Yeah, so the blame and the no no responsibility. Self-responsibility, yeah. Okay, awesome. And it felt like throwing daggers. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, people who think it was not violent, why would you say it's not violent? Anyone? Yeah. Um, maybe because there was no yelling. Okay, no yelling. So like there was there are certain thresholds that need to be crossed in order to meet what violent would be, right? And so yelling would be one threshold. Maybe if we outright called each other names, that'd be another threshold, right? And sometimes that does go there in this uh, in the bits in the beginning. Cool, awesome. So. We're going to be looking at something called nonviolent communication as formalized and developed by Marshall Rosenberg. And Marshall Rosenberg, uh, he says that he believes that he's contributing to violence on this planet every time that he engages in a moralistic judgment. Which is not to say that we never use judgment. We use judgment all the time in nonviolent communication. We judge what we're feeling and what uh, actions are meeting our needs or not meeting our needs. That's a kind of judgment. But the kind of judgment that Marshall Rosenberg thinks is violent is the kind that is moralistic. It says, you are bad, you are good, you deserve a reward, or you deserve a punishment. And that can look a lot of different kinds of ways, and we're going to get into that. Um, first, a couple more words on what nonviolent communication is not. To be very clear, nonviolent communication is not a weapon to make people do what you want. It is not a weapon to tone police others, right? And there are ways that people try to use nonviolent communication to do that, and then nonviolent communication gets blamed for that, where I would say that that's not the nonviolent communication. Just like I can use the English language to tell you all kinds of horrible things about yourself, I wouldn't blame that on the English language. There are other things that I think can be improved about the English language, but I don't think it's responsible for that specifically. Um, and nonviolent communication, finally, is not really about nonviolence, and it's not really about communication. It's called nonviolent communication to highlight the little violences we commit against ourselves and against each other every day. So it's meant to juxtapose that. And then it's called communication because it's a lot easier to talk about the words that we use rather than the mindset and the way that I navigate through reality, right? Because I can say I love you in a way that manipulates you, in a way that tells you shut up, stop bothering me, your needs aren't important, leave me alone, right? And I can say, hey douchebag, in a way that engenders intimacy and connection and, and <laughs> honors your needs and, say, and says I care about you, right? So it's not actually about the words. That happens all the time, every day. It's not actually about the words. We just use the words as a proxy to talk about the thing that we want to talk about. Does that make sense? Cool. So then, what is nonviolent communication if it's not all those things that it's not? This, at its heart, is nonviolent communication. Look how pretty. So pretty. Three concentric circles. Right. You need some more info? Fine. I'll give you some more info. So this is a target. So nonviolent communication, we are working to center the needs of the situation. My own needs, other people's needs. I want to honor my needs while honoring the needs of others. That's key. 
well, what, how do I know what my needs are and how do I know whether they're getting met? That is where feelings come in, and feelings are very helpful. And then on the outer ring is observations. And then off the board, when you throw a dart and you totally miss, we get judgments. And so the big, I think of them as the big four. There's a lot of different kinds of judgments, but I think of the big four as right, wrong, good, bad, good, evil, and should, shouldn't. Now this is nonviolent communication at its heart. And it looks very simple. And it is. Just like all that I think the best things in life are. But it's not easy. But it's not, it's not that it's hard because of something intrinsic to this. It's hard because we're not taught this. It's hard because the education we receive from society at large is the complete flip of this, right? How often do you ask yourself or do you hear other people ask, what am I needing right now? I can see that you're upset. What is it you're needing? What would help contribute to your needs? Has anyone ever heard anyone ask that question? Has anyone ever heard themselves ask that question? Sometimes people have. A lot of people in, in today's world do not. How many people have heard, is this good? Is it wrong if I do this? Am I bad if I do this? What do you think should, should I do? Right? We ask ourselves those questions all the time. We're always guided by the world of judgment. Because, and this is what I think Marshall Rosenberg's big insight was, is that this is a language of domination. Because I can convince you to do something that violates your needs and the needs of those around you if I can convince you it's good. And that honoring your needs and honoring the needs of others is bad or evil or wrong. But if you're connected to your needs, Marshall Rosenberg says people in touch with their needs make very bad slaves. He means that in a lot of different ways. Um, so this is the basic idea. And so the feelings, a lot of people in social emotional learning in general, and also in nonviolent communication, will sometimes, uh, I would say mistakenly, center feelings. They get stuck on the feelings. This is what I'm feeling. What are you feeling? And they talk about that all day. But feelings are important, but they're important insofar as they point to what our needs are, right? The feelings aren't the center ring. I feel glad, and that tells me that my needs are being met. I feel upset, and that tells me my needs are not being met. Okay, if my needs are not being met, then what needs do I need to work on me, right? And the observations help us understand why that need's not being met. What, what is it that happened that triggered that need in me, right? And even a judgment is a clue to whether our need is being met. If, I, if, I, if you do something, and I think, oh, what an asshole, right? That's a clue. Oh, okay, that violated a need of mine. Like, and then I can take a pause and say, hold on, let me think about that, right? And so the judgments come most often when we're overwhelmed by a feeling. Because if I'm sitting with you and I'm talking and you tell me something and I'm not overwhelmed by whatever feelings come up, I might be able to hold space for that, right? I can say, yeah, I can see why you would think that. Like, yeah, I get that, that's hard. Like, I'm sorry to hear that or whatever, right? But if I'm overwhelmed by a feeling, now you're an asshole, right? It's not, it has nothing to do with me. You did the bad thing, right? Now I have to deal with the fact that you're bad. So that's where the judgment comes from, is that we're overwhelmed by a feeling. But the problem with the judgment is that it doesn't actually get our needs met. And it doesn't digest, it doesn't process those feelings. And that's why even when uh, something bad happens, I, and I could be, my judgment could be correct, right? But if I'm not actually dealing with my feelings or needs, then I'm still walking around with stuck feelings all day. Even if I'm right that you're bad or whatever the situation is. So, to summarize again, we have needs pointed to by feelings, pointed to by observations, and we have judgments around the outside, and the entire society is flipped on this, right? A lot of people, like very few people are at all connected to their needs in this society. A lot of people aren't even connected to their feelings, right? 
How often do you ask someone what they're feeling and they don't know? How often do you not know what you're feeling? Right? Sometimes it even gets into like bodily sensations. Like we don't even know what, what bodily sensations we have. So we, someone's walking around and like, you're really tense. I'm like, I didn't even notice. Right? The more removed we are and disconnected we are from our bodies, the more disconnected we are from our needs, the more we fall into this language of domination. Cool. Any questions? Anything like that? All right. So we're going to take a, a deeper look at these uh, target components. We're going to play a game called This Not That. So we're looking at observations, not evaluations, right? It's just another way of saying judgment. So we want to stick as much as possible to the observation. So when I'm talking to you and I say, listen, this thing that you did, it triggered whatever needs in me. I want to stick as much as possible to when you said the words so-and-so, right? Rather than when you yelled at me like a total brat, right? That's, that's more into this. And it's not always clear where the observation is and where the evaluation is. That takes practice, right? But that's, that's why this is a practice and not something you can just learn. I'm sorry to tell you this. You're not going to walk away after this being an expert in nonviolent communication, right? You know, but I'll give you resources to keep practicing. So observation, not evaluation. This is a fun one. This is feeling, not non-feeling. What's a non-feeling? A non-feeling is a, it's actually a judgment rather than stating like what my feeling is. Um, an example of that, a big clue, is if you ever say, I feel verbed. So if you say something to me and I say, when you say that to me, I feel insulted, I didn't actually tell you how I felt, right? What I told you is that I'm judging that the thing you did was insulting me. Or I feel ignored. Marshall Rosenberg likes to use that example a lot because sometimes when he thinks he's being ignored, he feels fantastic, right? Please leave me alone. <laughs> Please give me space, right? Being ignored is not a feeling. Being insulted is not a feeling. Being offended or uh, abandoned, none of those are feelings, right? Those are judgments about what other people have done to us. So as much as possible, we want to stick to the observation and then state what our feelings are. Me, there are a different models about what, uh, what feelings count as feelings, and there's like some controversy around some of them. I like to stick to what I think, again, are the big four in this way. There's glad, sad, mad, and afraid. Afraid. <laughs> right? And that just makes it easy. And then you can have different levels and you can have combinations. But if I'm ever stuck, if I'm ever not sure what I'm feeling, I ask myself, am I feeling this way? Am I feeling this way? Feeling this way? Feeling this way? And just like we talked about with the target, right? The feelings are a clue to what's happening with our needs. Feeling glad is a clue that our needs are being met. And the more glad we are, the more they're being met, sometimes overflown. Uh, feeling sad is often a clue that we have lost a need that there is loss somehow. And now we need to do mourning. We need to meet the need in another way as well as mourn and meet that need for mourning. Um, feeling fear is a clue that there is a threat that our needs might be lost, that we might experience loss. And feeling anger is a clue that uh, our needs have been violated. Not just that they haven't been met, but that the need has been violated. So those four are really big clues as to what's happening with our needs. And when we're talking about needs, it's not that we're talking about needs, not strategies or wants. How do you do, determine the difference between a need or a strategy or a need or a want? The key here is that a need is universal. So every single person on this planet, human or non-human, has the need for independence, and every single person on this planet has the need for connection. Right? So those things are needs. But not every single person has the need for a car. And a car is a common and popular vehicle ha, to meet the needs for independence and connection both. But because not every single person needs a car, it's considered a strategy. Now, there's a, an asterisk here in the need, not strategy situation. Um, 
Oh, one more thing about it first is that uh, needs are not tied to specific people, right? My need is not for you to shut up. That's not a need. I might need space and quiet, and then I would ask you, could you help me meet my need for space and quiet by doing the strategy of not speaking right now, right? Whatever the case may be. Um, and I can say that in varying degrees of <laughs> aggressiveness or not. Um, but there's an asterisk here with the need not strategy, which is that white supremacist anti-socialism, which is what I call capitalism, white supremacist anti-socialism, because it drives us all apart from each other, is very good at rendering us dependent on strategies that profit it and isolating us from strategies that do not profit it. That's why a car is as popular a strategy to meet those needs as it is, because a car is very profitable for white supremacist anti-socialism, as opposed to self-sufficient farm farming, right? Where like the entire point of our modern economy is to kick people off of self-sufficient farming so that they can then participate in our system so that capitalists can profit, anti-socialists can profit. We can talk about that more too. <laughs> Um, so that's needs, not strategies. And then request, not demand. A request, how do we differentiate between a request and a demand under nonviolent communication? Is a request is if you are free to decline without any fear of punishment from me. Right? So if I say, hey, Claire, do you think that you could cover for me on the cooking tonight at uh, the Ash dinner or whatever, right? Do, does that, is that a request or a demand? A request? Is it a re what do we think? Request or demand? It sounds like it, right? But what if I ask the question the way I just did, like, hey, Claire, um, I was wondering, do you think you could cover for me tonight? And now you decline. No. <laughs> just like you. And I walk away. Okay. <laughs> if I, I, I made it sound like a request, right? But really, it was a demand. Because once you decline, then I, I punish you as a coercive measure, right? Um, now, that can also be tricky because maybe I am genuinely offering a request. Maybe you are totally free to decline, but you think, you hear it and receive it as, oh no, if I say no, they're going to think I'm bad, they're going to get mad at me, I'm going to be bad, I'm, I'm not going to live up to like all the expectations of the co-op, right? So I can ask a request, and someone might hear it as a demand. And if I have a history of making demands, then even when I do make a genuine request, I'm gonna need to be extra sure. Listen, like I know I've made a history of demands, but like you are genuinely free to decline on this one. Like I'm doing that work and like I want you to know, right? And sometimes, uh, yeah, and so one thing that can be really helpful when we're practicing this, and it can sometimes sound strange, but we can ask for a paraphrase. We can offer one or we can uh, ask for one, a paraphrase. So if I say, hey Claire, uh, do you think that you can cover for me on making dinner tonight? Um, and then you, uh, maybe you decline, or maybe before you even uh, get to your response, I say, can, but first, before you answer, can you tell me what you heard me say? Uh, and then you respond to me by saying, uh, yeah, you said I had to make dinner tonight, and like, now I can't like go out and do the thing that I wanted to do. I'm like, oh, okay, now I know Claire heard my request as a demand. Thank you for telling me, and then I can move forward accordingly and say, like, listen, no, like you're really free to decline, or whatever the case may be, right? Um, now, there's some difficulties with that request and demand uh, situation um, that there's a, a couple different ways someone can decline your request. Sometimes, if I say, hey, Claire, can you make dinner? Claire goes, absolutely not. Get out of my face. I'm too busy. I can't deal with this. I say, thank you. You made that no very clear. Uh, and <laughs> that's all I needed. Uh, I got what I wanted. Thank you very much. I'll go figure out how to meet my needs elsewhere, or whatever, right? Um, another way Claire can decline is if she says, oh, I don't know. I'm just, and I say, okay, hold on, wait, like, I don't want you to give it if it's going to put you in that kind of energy, right? Like, if there's another way, maybe you can do it later, maybe I'll ask someone else, right? But, like, you, you don't need to, like, put that on yourself, right? By far, the hardest situation that a person can decline a request 
is if they say no like this. Yeah, sure, no problem. That's really hard. Because now they've just agreed to a demand that I didn't know I made. Right? And when someone agrees to a demand, this is uh, another big insight, I think, from Marshall Rosenberg, is that when someone agrees to a demand, everybody pays for it, including me. She agreed to my demand, but I'm not going to get that. That's not a free dinner. That's, that's, uh, that's coming with an expectation or some resentment or, or some uh, unresolved tension, right? So if someone uh, agrees to a demand, there's always some lingering energy there. Everybody pays for it, including the person who made or uh, did not make the demand. Does that make sense? Any questions there? Cool. Yes, Bruce, you've explained everything so clearly that we have no questions. Great. Um, I have a question thanks. about the feeling. Yeah, totally. Um, one of the examples I think you gave was being ignored, was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would be the example of like the actual feeling? Would it be like the need to feel heard or the opposite, the need to feel independent? Or Totally. So uh, the, the need to be heard, that would go under a need. Oh, right. But if I'm, if I'm <laughs> feeling ignored... Uh, in a way that like I feel that I, like I want to express, right? Then it could be that I'm feeling sad because I really have a desire for connection with you. And uh, when you uh, haven't said a word to me in the past 10 minutes, right? Specific observation, um, then uh, then I feel sad because like I, I am, am not getting that need for connection that you get. And I really love that, right? Um, and so that's that's the idea of separating the feeling from the non-feeling, and that, uh, that can sound semantic, right? But the idea there is that in parsing these things out, we can better determine what I am responsible for, and part and parcel with what I am responsible for is what am I not responsible for. I cannot be holding on to things that I'm not responsible for, and simultaneously, be responsible for the things that I am responsible for. It doesn't work. I have to take responsibility for what I am responsible for and let go of what I'm not responsible for. And so this way, I, um, I am responsible for taking care of my feelings. I'm not responsible that a, that a feeling shows up, right? I can't, I can't say like, yeah, I, anger, I felt anger come up and that makes me a bad person, right? I'm not, I'm not responsible for a feeling in that way. But when anger comes up, now I'm responsible for doing something about it, right? That makes sense. Oh, sorry. Um, cool. Any other questions? Then? Okay. So sometimes, right? Most of the time, uh, this is obvious, and we don't need to go through this, right? Like I don't need to turn to Kristen and say. Um, Kristen, like, uh, when I see, uh, water on the floor, I feel sad because my need for cleanliness in the house is not being met. Would you pass me the paper towels? Right? Like, if I, I can just turn to Kristen and I can say, hey, can you pass me the paper towels? And we, we get it. Right? It's all there. And that, that's, and that's even if I'm, even if I turn to Kristen and I say, Kristen, would you pass me the fucking paper towel? Right? It's, it's still all here. And I can say, hey, asshole, would you do something about this? And it's still all here, right? And so then the big other insight with this is that I can practice nonviolent communication with people who are not practicing nonviolent communication with me. And so that's what we call uh, nonviolent communication as the nickname giraffe language because giraffes have the largest heart of any land animal because they need to pump blood up their really long necks. Hashtag structural engineer. Um, <laughs> but so... Uh, you can say, right, uh, hey, asshole, get out of my way, like, you're uh, being a total douchebag right now, and I can hear with my giraffe ears, that's what we call our nonviolent communication translation devices, my giraffe ears, oh, uh, when I am standing in your path, you feel angry because you have a need for efficiency right now, um, would I please move out of your way? Yeah, yeah, no problem, okay. And that's the amazing thing about this is that the more that I practice that and really can tap into it, which is not, again, it's simple, not easy, that's different, 
But the more that I practice that, I never hear a person call me an asshole ever again. Right? I never hear their judgment. Right? Imagine, imagine, like take this in, being able to walk through the planet and you are never receiving a judgment from yourself or from anyone ever again. Imagine the liberation of that, right? How free we would be. And that's why nonviolent communication, I would call it a language of liberation. Whereas the violent communication, the default communication is a language of dominance. The best lesson I ever got in nonviolent communication came from a trainer who said that the best lesson he ever got in nonviolent communication was from his dog. Uh, he had a new puppy, came home after hard days at work, and did not want any frustration, just wanted to relax. And he gets home and he sees that the puppy chewed up a bunch of things and peed and pooped everywhere. And he screams out, you asshole, I don't need this right now. How can you do this to me? Like, what are you trying to do? Ruin my life? And the dog runs into the room and looks up at him with his big doe eyes to, to say, are you okay? What's wrong? How can I help? And he realized in that moment that his dog heard all of his pain, right? All of his feelings and all of his needs and none of his judgments. He's a dog, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> right? But that's the idea, is that the more that we can tap into what I'm, if, the more I can tap into what I, my needs are and the more I can tap into what your needs are, we don't need these. Right? Calling you an asshole is shorthand for saying, please. That was Marshall Rosenberg says, the only two things people ever say to each other are please and thank you. Sometimes I say please by calling you an asshole. Sometimes I say please by using the word please. Sometimes, right, I can say in, in uh, uh, very default language of domination, I can say, uh, stop bothering me. You do this to everyone, right? And then in a little more like clinical heightened language of domination, I can say something like, don't you think you would be happier if you would consider other people's feelings every now and then, right? And like me, I'm Sicilian. I would much rather be called an asshole than like ask that question, right? Because like I grew up in a place where we yelled at each other and that was like our natural language. And, but the, what made it work when it did, which it didn't always do, what made it work is that when we were yelling and calling each other an asshole, we were connecting to our needs. When it's working, that's what's happening. Okay, so we, that's, that's the idea there, and we, most of the time, we don't need to go that formal. But sometimes when we're stuck, right, looking at the bare bones and the principles can really help us figure out where it is we're stuck, right? So this is the formula. When I see or hear observation, <coughs> I feel feelings because I need more needs. Would you be willing to request? Right? So maybe I know that someone did something to upset me. But when I get to I feel feeling, I don't know what I'm feeling. So I'm stuck. Then I can use clues. Okay, so that's the thing that they did, right? And I know that when that happens, it makes my life harder. Maybe I'm feeling angry. And I know that I'm tensing up, right? And uh, I can feel like my jaw clench and uh, my voice get tight. Um, or maybe I like, feel my whole body collapse. And what, what comes up for me when I see that is all the work that I have to do now. And maybe I'm feeling sad and discouraged because uh, I really needed more relaxation and now I'm realizing I'm not gonna get that relaxation, right? So like, we, we, this formula gives us those clues when we're stuck. Some people can, they, they can, get stuck in the formula. You only need the formula when you're stuck. Okay? But it's helpful. It's helpful practice. Some people, when they're in an argument, then it becomes a game. Right? There are examples of uh, people uh, in, in fights in their families, and uh, like a, a child will say, like, Mom, get the card. And then they, they look at the card and they say, is this one? No, it's not that one. It's a, Ooh, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. And then, like, and then everyone rejoices because now they're connecting at the level of those needs again. Right? But that, that is the revolution, I think, of nonviolent communication, is that rather than one person versus another person, right, each person trying to get what they want, viewing the other as an obstacle, now it's two brains looking at the same problem, working together, and now it becomes a puzzle, right? How can I meet my needs and your needs at the same time? How can we both, now we gotta practice creativity.
And that's why I think nonviolent communication honors that creative impulse in all of us. It was when we know how to, this is Marshall Rosenberg, what he thinks, and I happen to agree, but when we know how to, there's nothing we enjoy more than being able to give to, the, to another person's life. Sometimes we don't know how to. Sometimes we try to do it by calling each other asses. So here, the other thing about a request uh, is that we want to be as specific and actionable and using positive language as we can. Positive language, I don't mean like nice language, right? I mean, uh, would you be willing to not be an asshole? Is negative language, right? Because I'm telling you what I don't want. Would you be willing to, now we need to get specific, right? The reason that a lot of us use vague language around requests is because we don't want to take responsibility for what our request is. And that can be scary. Like once I realized, oh wow, actually the thing that would meet my need is if you would just never talk to me, right? That's a scary thing to realize. And it can be scary to ask for that. But not asking for it, or at least at the very least not being clear on it, is much less likely to get our needs met than if we're clear on it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. Um, we're doing really good on timing, actually. Um, so, um, now I can try to pull this more into um, some of our, how this relates to our activism work. Um, does that, does that sound good? Is that like a good place that we want to go into? Cool. Awesome. So, um, uh, I understand most everyone here is some kind of animal rights activist, right? Um, maybe, uh, somewhere on the veg spectrum, uh, or is doing some kind of advocacy work, uh, whether that's anti-racism, anti-sexism, just generally combating white supremacist anti-socialism. Cool. Um, <laughs> So there are ways that this is really helpful for there. I've put them in the two categories. There's really helpful for outreach, right? How do I talk to someone about veganism if they're not vegan, right? And I can connect with them on their needs. And then there's ways that it's really helpful for organizing, which is like more internal conversation. How do I deal with someone who already agrees with me about like the values, but now we're trying to organize a pressure campaign and we're screaming at each other, right? So there's the organizing and there's the outreach, right? Most of my work is in outreach, so like my examples tend to be heavy over there, but I, I try to do the organizing examples too. Um, but so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So with outreach, right? In a, uh, how many people here do like anonymous for the voiceless kind of mask stuff? That's my first one last week. Awesome, yeah. So. Uh, when people give you, uh, I imagine in those conversations, right, people give you reasons that they're not vegan, or like, they, they don't care. They, they care enough that they have, are having the conversation with you, right, maybe they, they didn't walk away and think like, oh, this is dumb, um, but there's some kind of resistance there, right? So in nonviolent, in nonviolent communication, we learn that every no is a yes to a need that is preventing them from saying yes, right? So if I say, no, thanks, like I'm not interested in this vegan thing, right? What I'm saying is I have a need that prevents me from going there. And now, okay, so if you have a need that prevents you from going there, like tell me a little more about like, what, like what, uh, what's stopping you from going there? And then I can say like, well, yeah, I mean, like I just love meat so much, right? Or um, like every uh, Thanksgiving, like I just get together with my family and like we have like this really wonderful time and like I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be that guy, right? I don't wanna do that. Like I don't wanna disrupt like the connection I have with my family. And so now like, oh, okay. So you have like a really strong need for connection with your family and you don't wanna disrupt that. Like that sounds really important and real. Like now I'm connecting to their need and now we can talk about ways to honor that need that can also connect to veganism, right? And now that I know that you have this strong connection with your family, like I wonder um, what they might think if they knew about all of the environmental racism that goes into 
uh, the animal agriculture industry, right? And like maybe that this can be a way that you can better connect with each other. Like I wonder if that would, and you know, to be honest, that's not a common thing that families bond over, but like that, <laughs> that, that, right, now we're brainstorming, now we're talking about that, right? So what is the need that's preventing people from saying yes, right? Um, and, uh, and then in the organizing side, right? If I'm organizing a pressure campaign, I, I was uh, in a protest against Richard Spencer. Do people, is there anyone here who does not know who Richard Spencer is? Okay, so Richard Spencer is a white nationalist, uh, which is a euphemism for a Nazi. And uh, he goes, less now, but he went around speaking at college campuses. Um, that was his thing, was uh, all of his talks at college campuses, they were, they were all recruitment efforts, right? It was all advertising for uh, white nationalism or Nazism. And so um, in this, uh, this protest, when we were organizing a protest against Richard Spencer, I was hearing uh, a lot of different. Uh, I was hearing a lot of different strategies come up, right? But we weren't clear on what uh, the the underlying like we we all had a general need for you know inclusion and peace and equality and and not Nazism, right? Um, but uh, we weren't clear on what those underlying strategies were. I heard people talking about uh, setting up a demonstration so that people could talk to us instead of having to hear Richard Spencer. And I heard people talk about um, setting up a distraction so that people couldn't hear Richard Spencer. And I heard people talk about um, uh, organizing and, and trying to recruit people because we didn't, the, the group I was in didn't have a strong presence at that particular campus, right? And, and I heard people talk about how much they wanted to punch Nazis in the face, right? And any one of those, those, those four different strategies, any one of those, we can talk about the merits of each one of those and, and the risks and advantages and disadvantages of any of those strategies, but we need to be clear that they're different and that we can figure out a way to combine them all, but it's through, it's in differentiating the needs and strategies and, uh, and the ways that we pursue that, that we can get super clear and be really uh, strategic in our thinking about how to figure out any obstacles there are, right? We could set up a party that can drown out Richard Spencer's voice, right? And, and just celebrate joy and love and we can hand out pamphlets or we could, uh, have a presence there where it says like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm an anti-racist socialist activist. Talk to me about like why Richard Spencer uh, is not going to help you, right? And we can have those more in-depth one-on-one conversations. Or we can deck ourselves out in uh, baseball gear and black block and be ready to fight Nazis, right? And any one of those, again, is a strategy that we can talk about. But m mixing them all together without a way of uh without a greater understanding of how to do that is going to uh heighten those risks involved which some of those strategies already have high risks right does that make sense so there's the outreach and there's the organizing are there any questions about specific examples yeah i have a question so yeah. you just mentioned uh, um different strategies and ways to kind of think of it where does the need come into play totally so where you're going with it um, I something. No, yeah, so in because I was getting with the, the organizing example, I was getting more at like uh, level depths of strategy, which those are all strategies. Yeah. Um, but the need, right? Maybe the need is uh, uh, protection for uh, impressionable young people who are like being exposed to a Nazi that, right? There's no academic controversy around whether Nazism is valid. Right? There's, there's political controversy, but how hosting a Nazi like Richard Spencer at a college campus lends some credence that like, oh, it's so controversial, like maybe there's like something to it though, because like it's being hosted at a college campus. Like, maybe I'm gonna hear these ideas that people are telling me like I shouldn't be listening to, right? So maybe the need then is for protection from impressionable young, for impressionable young people. Um, and maybe that's the thing that's like really, alive in me and maybe the need 
in another person is a really strong need for justice and there are people walking around and they they've done hate crimes like i know i have the list that like i've, I've researched some of the people who are going to be there right and i i want to i want to meet my need for justice via the strategy of decking myself in baseball gear right um so but being clear on like oh what's super alive for you is the need for justice and what's super alive for me is the need for protection and what's super alive for this person is the the need for inclusion and equality or whatever the, the the case may be right so knowing which needs are alive can really help us understand why different strategies are so important to people but then uh, uh, we can apply the same kind of thinking to the depths and levels of strategy and then how would you go about organizing a strategy once you're aware that there's various needs totally that want to be met so that is super individual uh, and, and context specific to every situation, yeah. right? So um, in, in that situation with Richard Spencer, uh, there were some complications, right? Like we, the college campus had initially rescinded, at one point rescinded their invitation. And so he was going to be speaking on a quad because that was considered public property. And so he's gonna be speaking outside. And then on our way there, uh, there was actually a court order that said the college campus could not rescind their invitation um, and that they had to host him inside the building, right? So, like, things like that will greatly affect what the strategy is. Personally, I love what the Black Student Union did at that college campus. That We, we didn't have a connection to the Black Student Union, unfortunately, so we didn't know that they were planning this. But they had... Uh, uh, it, it was free, but they had reserved all the tickets, as, ma as many tickets as they could, so that they sat in silent protest uh, while Richard Spencer was spouting off this Nazism to reduce the number of people who were able to listen to Richard Spencer at all. And then they took their more vocal protest to the question and answer session. I personally thought that that was a great strategy given that it was inside a building, right? If he was out on a public quad, like maybe all we would need is just really loud speakers and a good PA system and a bunch of distracting noise and then like a couple uh, chairs and tables on the, on the outside of the quad that say like, uh, hey, we know a lot about Richard Spencer, come talk to us and why he's not cool or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So d depending on those specifics, that's where then uh, the strategy gets more focused. Does that help? I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm confused around how this connects with nonviolent communication. Yeah. So um, one, once, we're, once everyone has agreed that we're all talking about the level of strategy. You're talking about the that, not the this. Yeah. So like, we, we can use this to help uh, get in tune with everyone's needs and what's alive in them and like why uh, one particular strategy might be more important to you and one particular strategy might be more important to me. But once we're all agreed that we're talking on the level of strategy, then it becomes just more focusing on the requests and demands. Like, here's my request, could we do this? And here, oh, you have some a different idea. Then it just becomes more talking to each other at that level, rather than constantly going into uh, observations, feelings, and needs, once all, that's already clear. Hmm. Like, once we're in a, a brainstorming session that's mostly primarily dedicated to strategy, then it's, we're staying over here at this level. Hmm. Does that help? I think so. Cool. Uh, and where does the demand come into play? Are you yeah. saying yeah, demands included? That's part of the process. Um, we're we're trying not to use demands simply because, right? Like none of this is to say that using judgments and uh, demands is wrong or bad, right? That that would be using violent communication about <laughs> nonviolent communication, right? The point is that. Marshall Rosenberg has found, and I agree, that when we use judgments and demands, we're less likely to get our needs met. And the purpose of nonviolent communication, which I meant to open with that, the purpose of nonviolent communication is to create the quality of connection that gets everyone's needs met, right? Like me and a stranger on the street, we don't have the quality of connection to just know what each other's needs are, right? So we need to talk to each other and use some language, right? Um, some people that I'm in, uh, deep loving friendships with like they don't need to say a word like I already know what's alive in them and I'm going to contribute and that quality of connection is there right so in an organizing uh, sense where like I'm in a group with people the more that we have that quality of connection 
the more that we can seamlessly and efficiently organize with each other, right? And if someone is in charge, especially if someone's in charge and there's power dynamics now involved, and now they're making demands about like, no, this is the way it's going to go, right? Now they're sowing discord in an organizing group that's not going to help get the needs met, especially the, the really important needs for safety uh, for people most threatened by <coughs> autism. Is that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Sweet, yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, what happens when one person's needs um, violates your own boundaries or your own needs? Totally. So, in non non communication, right, needs are universal. So, needs never conflict, right? My need for independence does not conflict with your need for a connection, it's the strategies that conflict. So maybe the way you meet your need for a connection is by uh, looking for me every possible chance you get and saying, like, Pierce, I want to talk to you about this, right? And my, the way that I meet my need for independence is that I lock the door and I put uh, uh, the uh, sensory deprivation stuff on my head, <laughs> right? And that's how I meet my need for independence. But the, but the strategies are the things that conflict there. And that might sound semantic, too, but the important thing there is that when we get clear on what it is I'm needing, now we can talk about more creative ways to meet that and more talk about more creative ways to meet your now that we're clear that the, the need that's not gonna that's not gonna change because all people have the same needs. The strategies can change. Does that help? Cool. Yeah, uh, over here. Um this might seem insensitive just by the nature of the topic that we're discussing, um, but you mentioned that you really liked what the Black Student Union did, which was basically buy up all the tickets or reserve all the tickets so that other people couldn't go. Mm -hmm. And what if other people have a need to be informed or a need to be educated, and their strategy for having that need met is to go and listen to this white supremacist and see if that's something, you know, <laughs> Obviously, like, if I had to label it, it might be labeled bad, but that then becomes a judgment. Mm -hmm. So how is it okay, and again, I don't want to be insensitive, but how is it okay that the Black Student Union's needs for protection trumped the needs for the people that wanted independence to decide for themselves? Totally, yeah. So there's the part of, I think, the um, the what what one of the recognitions that comes when we adopt nonviolent communication and there are other things that will allow for this recognition too but like there is no evading conflict right the needs don't <laughs> conflict but strategies do and we're always engaged in strategies all the time there's no i, I can't pursue a strategy list way to meet a need so um in that then, I'm always going to be in conflict and there's no getting out of that. And so then, the, uh, I think one of the biggest questions in that is, okay, well, how do we decide whose needs get prioritized? Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, that is most guided by whosever needs are most effective, right? So Richard Spencer can get up there and he can talk about uh, Nazism and that doesn't directly pose a threat to me because I can walk around and a Nazi will think like oh a white man like I'm not gonna like try to harass this person mm -hmm. but people of color they are much more directly affected by uh, people espousing Nazism and so for me then that question is like oh they're more directly affected so their needs get more priority than like my needs would for example mm -hmm. though the, the more that I connect to my needs. This is another uh, thing about nonviolent communication, is that this nonviolent communication will not work for stuff that violates needs. It only works for stuff that serves life, which is to say that, that honors everyone's needs. I can't use nonviolent communication to get a bunch of investors to go in on weapons manufacturing. It won't work. Because the more that I connect those investors to their own needs, the more than they then connect to other people's needs. So the more I'm connected to my needs, the more I'm connected to the needs of everyone. And when I'm connected to the needs of everyone, I also see 
whose needs are most affected by which things, right? So the more that I'm connected to the needs of everyone on this planet, the more that I understand that Nazism directly threatens specific people more than it threatens other people, including myself. Can I start that thought? Yeah. How would you bridge the gap like in this example where you're saying if you were talking to a weapons manufacturer and maybe their needs are, well, money, but let's just say that maybe have like an altruistic side where their needs are the freedom of a certain people. Totally, yeah. And so, you know, they're like, well, we, we're going to go to war because the, the freedom of the people of this country matter and the freedom of the people of the world matter. Like, how do you bridge the gap between if, if our needs in this country of freedom aren't met, then we're all going to die and the needs of that country are all going to be free. You know, totally, so yeah. How do you bridge that gap? Absolutely. So, um, the, remember, people who are in touch with their needs make very bad slaves, right? So if I'm talking to you uh, about like, why it's so important for you to be a weapons manufacturer, right? And, uh, and then it comes out like, yeah, I have a really strong need. for, And every single thing that we ever say and do is to meet a need, right? So even people who are pursuing strategies that we condemn, like they're trying to meet needs, right? So a weapons manufacturer, they might have a very strong need for safety for their country, right? Or um, they might have uh, a very strong need for uh, specifically safety for their family. Maybe they don't even care about like what it is they're doing, but they're doing it for the job and it makes them a lot of money and they, they care about their family and they know that this world is going to shit and that the climate crisis is threatening them and they need to protect their family and that's the most important thing to them. Or, uh, and, and so money, by the way, is considered a strategy uh, because it's not universal. Um, but again, white supremacist anti-socialism renders us dependent on the strategies that uh, profit. Um, but maybe um, you, what that uh, weapons manufacturer or a lot of uh, capitalists, I think, um, are driven by is a need for approval from their parents, especially their fathers, right? Like that, like I know if I do this, like my dad will finally be proud of me kind of thing, right? And, but that, that could be something that they're not aware of, right? So if I can connect you to your need for uh, connection, approval, or your need for safety, like once you're connected to that, I think then it becomes more, oh, damn. I'm never gonna get my dead father's approval by selling fucking missiles to a foreign government. That's not gonna work. Wow, right? Or like, uh, wow, I have a really strong need for safety, but I'm bombing people who then hate me after I bomb them. Maybe this is a bad strategy, right? So uh, by connecting to those needs, the more connected we are to the needs, the more we can see which strategies are working and not working. You had a that was actually very similar to my question. So I guess just, yeah. just to clarify then on like the univer universality of needs. So like in your um, in your example where your Kristen wants to talk to you and she's banging on the door and you're in your sensory deprivation stuff. Totally. Yeah. So in that case, your need is is independence, which is universal. Mm -hmm. But in in that case, she she might believe that her need is talking to you specifically. In mm -hmm. which case, that is not universal and therefore kind of like needs to be reevaluated as a need and like seeking connection somewhere else. Yeah, so the, the connection would be the universal need and then her strategy is uh, to seek connection from me and to seek connection from me right then in that moment by knocking on my door while I'm in my uh, you know sensory deprivation chamber or whatever and, <laughs> and like yeah, it, like depending on the specific like if I'm already in the sensory deprivation chamber like the more that Kristen is connected to her need for connection the more she might be able to see oh if I uh, jar Pierce out of his like mindfulness practice with his sensory deprivation I don't think that any conversation I have with him is going to meet my need for a connection after, the, after that point like once I've already put them in that place so I'm going to go meet my need for connection elsewhere or at a different time or whatever but that, that, the, that kind of natural awareness comes the more connected we are to the needs themselves. Because sometimes we get really attached and say, like, I need you to, talk, to do that, right? And then, and then we're not realizing that that is not uh, meeting our needs. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, and I don't know if this is a follow-up or maybe some other thing, but, like, uh, so are, are there ways then 
with like nonviolent communication as a framework, you know, we've been talking about like communicating with others. Is is it also like a framework to communicate with yourself? And are there any oh, like yes. elements of that? Absolutely. Into? Yeah. So how many of you have ever made a mistake? Never. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what are some of the things you say to yourself after you make that mistake? I knew it. Does that mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bad person. Bad person, right? Shouldn't so, shouldn't yeah, have. shouldn't. So using those, uh, those judgments, right? The big four of, like, the way society tells us we want to guide ourselves, right? Um, I think some other big ones, I think, are smart and stupid, or, um, uh, there, there are way, different ways people say that too. Like this makes sense or is reasonable or don't be emotional or irrational, right? Um, or, or different things along those lines, right? So, but when I make the mistake, right, I can also connect to my need and practice talking to myself in this way, right? Like I can say I was a dumb asshole, right? And that's one way to meet my need, right? And that comes from uh, the retribution model of justice, right, is, uh, oh, they did something wrong, so I'm going to scold them until they then turn around and say, yes, you're right, I'm bad, like, and then they, they internalize that scolding, right, and absorb how bad they are. And then once they do that, they've paid their penance, and then we can carry on, and that's, that's justice served, right? As opposed to nonviolent communication is much more about restorative justice, right? Like, oh, that didn't meet my need or that violated my need, I uh, would like you to know that so that you have that feedback. And now can we talk about ways that I can meet my need and maybe like some actions you can do to help me do that or like I just want you to know that and like I'm good, I can meet my needs now that that's been communicated, right, whatever. But so uh, I did something wrong and I'm a dumb asshole versus um, I... Uh, uh, ate too many chips when I was doing my homework or whatever it was, right? So, um, and, and even too many is the, like, if the more specific we get on the observation, then the more we can realize, like, oh, wow, my feelings are that strongly attached to, like, when I do this specific thing in this specific way, or if I overstep by this specific amount or whatever the thing is, right? Um, rather than thinking, like, I'm a failure and I'll never change and, right? And so one way is actually talking to us as though we are creative and intelligent and can learn and can adapt. And the other way is talking to us as though we're already bad and a failure and we just need to be reminded of it until we stop doing that, right? Which is, I think, also a very um, a fundamentalist model of that retribution, right? Like the original sin concept. Um, but so then, like getting in touch with our feeling, oh, when that happens, I feel really discouraged and, and sad about this. And wow, that I didn't realize, but that really affects my needs for uh, like honoring my self or whatever the, the case is, right? Um, and now that I'm connected to that, um, one of the needs that I think uh, is, uh, I think it's really lovely that it gets acknowledged as a need, is mourning. We have a need to mourn what is lost. And so now that I realize that in doing that, I lost an opportunity, like I need to mourn that and just like allow myself to be in that space or whatever my mourning practice is, right? And so that's a way then that we can connect to ourselves at that level. And again, right? Imagine walking around the world and never receiving a judgment. Where do we receive judgments from more often than any other person? So. So imagine walking through the world and never judging yourself ever again. That's the emotional liberation right here. That's what this is. And so that's why when I'm with people and they're throwing a lot of heaviness at me, it's with the, uh, the giraffe ears that I can hold space for that. Because whatever it is they say to me, whether it's, no, I'm not telling you my feeling, I'm telling you you're a piece of shit. No, you didn't uh, violate my need. You're just a bad person. They could say those words, and all I hear is, uh, when I did this, 
they felt angry because they violated their need for and in the future could I be more mindful? That's all I hear. Yeah. Okay. That's question. Great. Yeah. Thank you for being open for so many questions. Totally. Um, I have two quick. Um, number one, since you brought up like original sin, where is spirituality? Where is religion in this? Like I was thinking, oh, I have a need for prayer or a need for whatever, but that maybe sounds more like a strategy to reach a need. But what, like, how does that come in? Totally. Yeah. Um, like I, I personally don't get too caught up on the words of the need, right? Like, we, we can talk about whether prayer is a need or a strategy, right? But I, I think that also gets into, like, what does prayer mean to people, right? But, um, like, in, in language that's just more immediately, uh, like, available to me, like, what comes to mind is a deep need for connection and a deep need for purpose. And uh, in, in my world, like, I feel most uh, connected in that spiritual way when I'm contributing to others. And so that, for me, is my need for contribution. Um, and so when I can contribute to other people's lives, when I'm in service, mm -hmm. right, that's when I feel that kind of, like, greater purpose, higher connection thing. And so for me, that's how I tap into that. So that would be, like, your strategy, like, in being in service to others would be your personal strategy to meet the need of feeling connectedness to yeah. higher... Yeah, for me, that's, that's what does it. And, and for some people, you know, it can be uh, some other practice that they have. Um, and it, it's, you know, it works with whatever specific faith you have. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that can be, we can talk about that being strategies too. Um, but yeah, I, uh, if you're interested in that specific line, there's a, a shorter book. The, the bigger one is Nonviolent Communication. That's like the book is not. So going into that, there's Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. There's Nonviolent Communication, the workbook. Uh, written by, I believe her name is Lou, L-E-U, is her surname. Um, and then there's uh, my personal favorite book on the subject of nonviolent communication is called Decolonizing Nonviolent Communication. Um, it's written by a person named Minachi, and you can get that one from the Women's Center for Creative Work. And it takes nonviolent communication and a decolonial lens um, because I, I find that the book... And the practice of nonviolent communication is decolonial and leftist in all the ways that I know and love. And uh, that language is not explicit in the book, right? So in the book Decolonizing Nonviolent Communication, they make that analysis very explicit. Um, and, uh, and then on the note of spirituality, uh, Marshall Rosenberg has one book called Practical Spirituality, which is all about using nonviolent communication in a service that it, it is, on the one hand, very... Uh, concrete in like living our lives and in the other uh, and on the other hand gives us that sense of connection and, and purpose that I find that it does um, so there's that um, and then uh, just uh, some more examples to draw from to demonstrate because a lot of people don't understand that nonviolent communication is leftist at its heart um, but Marshall Rosenberg himself he doesn't go around uh, saying this all the time but in my analysis, uh, from what I can tell from his interviews, he's a total anarchist. Um, the, in the concept of nonviolent communication, nobody pays for anything. Nobody charges for anything. All you do is you say, this is what I'm offering, and the request I have is you know, this amount of money so that I can continue offering this to other people. Right? It's all about gift giving. Mm -hmm. And it's all about when I give to you, I feel given to. And that is inherently an anti-capitalist practice um and he himself on the note of uh uh especially like tone policing and victim blaming um he was in an interview that uh that i really love it um Wait, i don't sorry. know yeah do you mind just sharing what tone policing is oh yes okay thank you so tone policing is uh is if i am uh more concerned with how you are talking to me and the tone you are using than I am with your content. So maybe I said some really racist, awful, sexist, hurtful things, right? And then you say, hey, you know, Pierce, like when you said those things, um, like I felt really hurt and like I want you to be more aware and, uh, and like I just, yeah, I felt really uh, insulted. And I say, that's not a feeling. And then I walk away, 
right? Like the, I'm tone policing, like the way you talk to me. Like you didn't use good NBC when you did that, so that means that I don't have to pay attention to any of your needs, right? <laughs> so, but the the idea there is that um, <coughs> instead of focus, like maybe you're screaming at me, but if you're screaming at me, I can still possibly, depending on my own emotional bandwidth in that moment, I can say, oh, uh, I see when I did that, like the, that violated your needs for whatever the needs were, um, I'm going to be more mindful of how I speak now. Like that's something that I can practice, right? So um, the, the tone policing then becomes a way that I deflect responsibility and I put it back on you. And I say, I'm not going to have any conversation about my behavior until you meet the standard needed to talk to me about my behavior. And that will come never, right? Um, so that, so in, in that conversation, um, Marshall Rosenberg is in an interview with, I don't know much about the interviewer, but like my impression, right, is a very woo, white, spiritual person. And uh, in that interview, she says, that's the thing I really love about nonviolent communication is like this really radical sense of self-responsibility that we're all responsible for creating our own reality. And his response, Marshall Rosenberg's response to that is, yes, well, I appreciate that. And I'm sure you know that that is a common uh, way, is, as a common deflection of responsibility to blame the victim. And that it's not just ourselves that create our own realities, it's also other people who create our own realities, especially, if I may add, gangs. And some gangs call themselves gangs, and some gangs call themselves multinational conglomerates. But they create our realities too. And so that's, that's Marshall Rosenberg's own language, like on record in a video recording. That, that's not me. So like that he is, the way I see it, a, a total leftist at, at the heart of what, what this is. Yeah. So I have two questions that are linked together. Totally. Can, a need, can my need always be met? And what if the request does not meet my need? Totally. Um, so uh, there are infinite strategies to meet uh, needs. So I would say that there are infinite strategies if I agree that option one doesn't work, or if I'm like set on I want this request. Totally. Yes. I mean you. Yeah, that's what I'm more like. Okay. That. Yes. Yeah. This, this is a request. This is what I need. So and then I can't get it. So this sounds like there's. So I'm wondering what happens in that situation. Yeah. Totally. So um, there's there's the question of what each person is responsible for, right? So like if you have made it clear that y you are not going to budge on whatever, right? And maybe this comes up a lot too is like uh, if my request of you is that I would really just love for you to say the words like, oh, I see that now. Um, I will uh, try to be more mindful. If you could just say those words to me, that would mean a lot. And then you're like. Yeah, like, I see that now, like, I try to be more mad. But my, my request is that you, like, say it like you mean it, right? Like, but how do I get, express that in an, like, actionable and positive way or whatever? Or, like, so maybe you just can't go there, right? Like, maybe that's, like, you, you went through the actions, right? You honored my request as written, literally. Um, or, like, you're just pursuing whatever strategy you want. And, like, then my responsibility at some point is, like, Okay, so I don't know your name, what's your name? Theron. Theron. So, okay, Theron is just going to do their thing. And, like, that, that means now I'm responsible for pursuing my needs elsewhere and or setting new boundaries with Theron. So if, if I know that every time Theron's ever going to talk to me, they're going to, like, t tell me I'm a piece of shit, right? If that's, just, if that's your strategy, every time you ever talk to me is calling me a piece of shit, and, and that's your, that you're attached to that strategy to meet whatever weird needs you have that, that needs. <laughs> then, like, then I need to decide, like, okay, is that something that I can do? Or do I need to set the boundary of, like, not coming into contact with Aaron again? And so at some point, I need to decide what boundaries I have in, in, in that relationship. Does that help? It, it's not a way to get people to do what you want. Marshall Rosenberg suggests, he says, if you want... That's what, that's a good, that's what I'm trying to clarify. Yeah, um, totally. Because, yeah, in my own belief system, I feel like I'm responsible for my own feelings and needs and to make them myself. So when I, what I'm trying to clarify is that 
the request to change the external circumstance, which is out of my control ultimately. Totally. Always, in every case. Like to to make sure that I'm understanding that NBC is like not dependent on external condition. Yeah. And wondering what those strategies are, which I think you just outlined. Totally, yeah. Which are internally, oh, how do I change how I strategize my or how do I get my need met through different requests? Because the first request might not always work. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I like I have a really deep need for uh, a a kind of uh, equality and inclusion and peace and love and connection and all that 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 inherently means that uh, there be no white supremacist anti socialism on this planet, right? Um, and I I also have to face the reality that I cannot make that happen, not on my own anyway. I can organize and exert pressure campaigns, right? But I, I can't walk around and tell people, like, you're going to stop being racist now, right? Um, and and I, can, I can try, and people do, right? And when they, when they pursue that strategy, most of the time it doesn't meet their needs and doesn't work, right? Um, Could you repeat what you said then, that you're not supposed to... NBC is not to be used. It's, it's not a way to make people do what we want. Marshall Rosenberg actually says, if what you're looking for is a way to make people do what you want, the, the two best ways he knows are a gun and dog obedience school. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's all he knows as far as making people do what you want. And, um, but again, anytime we make someone do what we want them to do, if, if it's a demand and they're exceeding it to it for fear of punishment, we're going to pay for that too. And that's why it's not going to meet our needs. Um, yeah. D does that help? Does that help? Yeah. That okay. Thank you for answering. I have to confess that I have 3,000 questions. <laughs> no. I'm going to summarize it in one. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm going to do it with your personal opinion or with the, with the thing, the album things. Okay. But do you think the Nazis have needs? Oh, yes. Okay. Do you think so, a what, sir? Do, the question is do I think that Nazis have needs? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Every every person has the same needs, and uh, and I would even go so far as to say a, what a, makes a person a person is declaring a given set of needs, right? Mm -hmm. So I would even include I would include non-human animals in that, like, and and then I would include like a river has needs, right? So what what makes a river a river, what makes a chicken a chicken, what makes a person a person is the set of needs that we're talking about. That's, the, that's how I think of what personhood is. So then in terms of like a Nazi, then, right, they, they're pursuing need, they're pursuing strategies, in my mind, most likely to meet the needs for safety. Like they, you know, they, they have a worldview that uh, white people are under attack, right? So like they're then pursuing strategies to defend white people. And so, and that's where I think a lot of, um, because we're, because we exist in this world that is so, uh, it's like, it's thought supremacy, that we're so focused on, on thoughts and judgments, right? That, that's where all those fluff pieces after the 2016 election came out, like, this person voted for Trump and like, and loves Richard Spencer, like, tell us, like, what, how do you think the way you do, right? And like, it's because we're so focused on, like, I don't understand how you can think this way. I don't understand, like, your worldview, right? Explain it to us. And what do we do when we do that? We just end up platforming a bunch of Nazis, right? Whereas we could, uh, after the 2016 election or, or in our lives, be, uh, be talking to Nazis about, that, that's, that I have, so I have Nazis in my family. Um, I think what, that, what is a Nazi? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would I would describe uh, Nazism as uh, a believer in white supremacy, white nationalism, thinking about uh, the the white nation as something that needs to be prioritized and specifically safeguarded, um, and and those kinds of things. And there's a lot of things that go into that and associations with that. Um, right? Uh, you have like the the Nazis are traditionally. Uh, also sexist and capitalist and and homophobic and all kinds of things. But um, but so in my relationships to the the Nazis in my life, um, I can have these relationships with them because I can empathize them with them at the level of feelings and needs, and not 
at the level of judgments. I don't need, and that, that's where so many, I've, and this happens, uh, li liberals, uh, no offense to any people who identify as liberals, in the room, liberals will go into a conversation with a Nazi and they'll like try to, like, no, I think like with some conversation, like I can help this Nazi like see the light. And then they walk out of the room a fucking Nazi, right? They, they it happened, the thing that they were trying to do happened to them. And the way to prevent that in, in the best way I know in my uh, experience is that I empathize with needs and feelings, but I set a boundary. I do not empathize with thoughts and judgments and worldview and like cognitive understanding, right? So like, do I understand that the people in my family are afraid and that they have a need for community, even if that need for community shows up in, uh, in the ways of uh, uh, joining a Nazi biker gang? Like, I, I can understand that feeling of fear, and I can understand that need for community, and I do not empathize with the judgment that white people are being replaced in the great replacement theory or white genocide, and, and I do not empathize with their fear of uh, undocumented black and brown immigrants. That help? Yeah? Hey, um, so based on what you just said, um, when the feelings and needs and Nazis and judgments, do you think Nazis should be allowed in animal rights spaces rather than? So, okay, so that is a great question. Um, so in the context of like an organizing space, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're trying to pursue collective liberation for all, right? Um, I think that uh, in those... That space is not working for collective liberation. Exactly. It's just yeah. liberation. Well, so I, I would say that, that you, can, you can try to pursue, this is what else, that, you can try to pursue the strategy of inviting Nazi vegans into your organizing space and see if that meets your needs, right? My, my hypothesis is that it will not. Um, and yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and people, people have this idea that um, to build a truly inclusive movement means that we have uh, men's rights activists alongside feminists, alongside... Uh, uh, the transphobic uh, uh, turfs alongside trans people, alongside Nazis, alongside black and brown people, and and we're all marching together for animal liberation, right? Um, and, then, and some people make that argument, and um, and I I would say that that doesn't work. It's a it's a uh, a strategy that's not going to meet your needs, um, partly on the basis of. Uh, your what what is your movement then when you when you make it quote inclusive in that way you end up with a movement of Nazi vegans because the feminists and women and people of color and, and trans people they, they leave because they are their needs for safety is not being met um, but also uh, in that in the same vein um, where's I going with this too is that um, if I, uh, if I don't see the ways that those things are connected, um, then I'm, uh, the, those people have a power, like a, a turf has a, a power, a cis person has a power that a trans person does not have, and they don't, the trans person doesn't have that assured level of safety. So in that way, right, wh whose needs get prioritized are the people who are most affected, right? And so we can talk about how animals are most affected, but in that organizing space, there are other people with needs, and the trans person's needs are more affected than the cis person in, uh, in that need for safety, because they don't have that need met elsewhere. And so if you have a need that is not met in most of society, then it is extremely important that there be a way to meet that need somehow in some space. And so if the way that I meet that need is by going to my animal rights uh, organizing group, and now I find out I can't even meet that need there, then like, then there's no point in going for me because I need to take care of myself. Yeah? Um, so I have a question. What if, what, uh, in the organization, the Nazis, the people are Nazis, um, they change? Or they're open to change? All right, okay. Like, how do you work with that? Yeah, so, so like in that, there's, there's like what there's the like what do we do about Nazis is like the question right 
So like, <laughs> um, so like, if if there is a, a Nazi who wants to throw down for animal rights, like, they, if they want to post about it on Facebook, like, I'm not going to tell them they can't do that, right? But if I'm organizing a space with other people, now I'm going to be minding other people's needs. Um, and so the question is, like, what is the space and what is the platform, right? Um, and so what was your specific question? Um, it was more like, should I put my need on? Of course, I don't want the Nazi person in the room. Like, if I, I mean, I won't like what he has to say, but maybe he or she can change or wants to change. Right, right. So should I put my need on my need of not wanting him or her there uh, over him? Totally. So there's there's a couple aspects to that, right? So like. One is the question of like, will they change? Which like we don't know, right? If there's a if there if you got a foolproof way to change a Nazi, like fucking publish that. Like we need to know. But um, so like, whatever that is, that that's a gamble, right? So that's a but um, and people have there is a, a a deeply embedded idea in our society that like oh if I only give them like enough empathy and love like they'll change, right? And over and over again, that is not foolproof. That, that is, has been shown not to be foolproof. Does it ever work? Sure, but it's not foolproof. And so then the question is, like, if, if it's not even foolproof, right, then you want to sacrifice your own needs to empathize with another person. There's a, a phrase for that in nonviolent communication. It's called empathy from hell. So if I'm, like, stressed the fuck out, right, and now you want to talk to me about your feelings, I'm like, I can't do that right now. I need to resource myself, right? I can try to sit down and empathize with you, but like, what's gonna come out is, yeah, uh-huh. Like, yeah, no, like, yeah, that's a feeling, uh-huh, right, yeah, you have it, uh-huh. And like, and you're not gonna get your need for empathy met and connection. And I'm gonna just be so more- So first your needs, first your peace. Yeah, I, I need to be responsible for, for myself. And so, you know, that's like, especially, uh, earlier on in these conversations with my uh, with my family members and like you know like I, and I get like you don't have to have conversations with Nazis I'm like I'm a cis, wealthy white cis male like I'm not telling people like everyone needs to talk to a Nazi in their life like but uh, Nazi is against Jewish people yeah but you call a, a white supremacist Nazi yeah but so like I I have family members who are I I consider them Nazis they don't self identify that way but. Um, but like I have family members who are Nazis, so I I want I choose to keep that relationship, right? So the, by no means are you required to keep a relationship that you don't feel safe in. I happen to feel safe, right? So I can make that decision without fear of my safety in that way. Um, and in that conversation, like what, once I've made that decision, I've found that empathizing with them at the level of needs and feelings, but setting a boundary that I do not empathize with them at the level <laughs> of judgments and thoughts, that has been a way that I can maintain myself in that. I can honor myself while being in relationship with them. So wouldn't that also then be practiced inside of an activist group to say that you can be here and we can all work together at the level of our needs and our feelings, but if anybody, whether it be a Nazi or a non-Nazi or anybody else, brings in a judgment or a good and evil or a right and wrong, then yeah. we're then we as a collective group are not going to currently empathize with that. Let's like get back on task rather than saying like you're a Nazi, get out. Um, that there are there are ways that that can happen, right? And there are thresholds and different boundaries. So like if someone says, uh, you know, I just don't understand why people think uh, think uh, eating animals is good and like I like sometimes I just really am overwhelmed and I think that they're bad people, right? Like I I wouldn't like say like, whoa, we need to stop everything because that is a judgment and that's not helping us you know, like I would you know, I wouldn't like stop everything and throw down to like have a different conversation about that. Mm -hmm. But if someone says, um, yeah, like I don't know, it's it's all these people of color who are uh, eating all the animals and we need to do something about them. Um, which like, you know, they wouldn't phrase it that way. Um, but like, if, if something like that happened, then I would stop what was happening and I would say, okay, that needs to be a conversation and like, uh, you know, maybe that has to happen without other people in the room who might be more affected by that conversation or like whatever the case is, but like there's the threshold and the boundaries, different levels. Yeah. Um, also on the note too is 
So we talked about um, outreach and we talked about ways that we talk to ourselves when we make a mistake. There are also the ways that we can talk to ourselves when we do good, right? Because the, 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 the whole concept of nonviolent communication is about needs, right? So we don't ask the question. We never ask the question, is this good? Is this wrong? Do I deserve reward? Do I deserve punishment, right? The whole concept of reward and punishment is based on this retribution model of justice. And so that includes rewards. Rewards take us out of the present moment just the same way punishments do, and needs live in the present moment. And so I can only connect to my needs if I'm alive in the present moment. And so I can think like, you know, I'm awesome, right? But like, what happens when I too strongly identify and attach myself to that judgment is now I'm walking around, to use some judgment language, I'm walking around like an entitled dick, right? And uh, in, in needs language, that'd be like, I'm uh, prioritizing my needs more than the needs of others. Like, I'm prioritizing minor needs compared to, like, more fundamental needs of others, right? Because, like, I'm awesome, and that means that I get stuff that I want, right? And so, um, and so, and there are, uh, there are ways that we can talk to ourselves about, like, the things that we do that are, that we value, right? Like, oh, when, like, when I had that conversation with that person, and then, like, they really, like, got it, and, like, they understood, like, why white supremacist anti-socialism is hurtful and like how veganism can be a useful practice for that like that just really met my need for like connection and shared reality and contribution and like I feel great and I'm gonna celebrate because we ha we all have a need to celebrate things too that celebration is a deep need joy is a deep need so we all have those needs too and when we can tap into that that better feeds that connection in a way that like yeah I'm good like that doesn't that doesn't do it it doesn't have that same connection with myself when I can tap into myself and say, like, I, what I did just now really met my need for purpose and connection. And that's beautiful. Um, and then uh, in another way, I actually really like uh, flipping this to, um, so Jay Smooth has a really awesome video on YouTube where he talks about the who you are conversation versus the what you did conversation. So when we see someone say something or do something racist, it can feel like the best way to handle that is to run up on them and say like, you're racist, right? But then what happened when we saw the thing that they said or did, when then we turn it into a who you are conversation, that's easy for them to pull out. Because now they can say, you don't know me. Like, yeah, so I made a joke or whatever. Like, that's just one thing. And like, I'm not gonna be a hell, I'm not gonna have my character assassinated based on the one thing you saw, right? Whereas if we can stick to the what you did and what you said conversation, right? Stick with the observation rather than, rather than the judgment. We can say like, hey, when you said that thing about people of color, like I, I felt pain and that doesn't meet my need for consideration or, or whatever the, the need in question is, right? And so then they can, they can try to duck out of that conversation, but it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder than if I just say, you're a racist. And they say, no, you're not. No, I'm not. Right? That conversation is much harder. And this, so and then the flip of it, too, and when, so when I'm talking about things I don't like about other people, I can also flip it into talking about things I do like about myself. I really like what Jonathan Safran Foer has to say about how he does outreach. He wrote a book called Eating Animals. It's one of my favorite books on the, the culture of eating animals, which is really what the book is about. Uh, is the, the culture of uh, speciesism in that way. And, um, and he says, I never tell people I'm a vegan. Like, if they ever notice anything weird about my plate, I say, uh, yeah, I'm trying to cut back on, on animal products. I'm trying to cut back on eating meat. That's what he says. He never says, he never tells them, I, yeah, I happen to eat zero meat and I'm trying to cut back. He says, I'm trying to cut back eating because this is what happens when, when that, they say, oh, what do you got, a salad? Like, that's weird. Like, yeah, I'm vegan. Oh, ha, okay, I'm not, this conversation's done, right? It's over, is it? Because now I'm speaking in terms of identity, in terms of what I am, and you've already decided you're not. So the, there's no more conversation. But if they say, hey, that's a salad, that's weird, like what's up with that? And I say, yeah, I'm trying to cut back on my meat intake or whatever, I'm trying to, I'm trying to eat less meat. Now the question is like, wait, why? And is that, are you, like, is that something I should do? And like, well, like what's, what, what's going on there? And then that becomes a conversation opener rather than a closer. 
So there's the ways that we label ourselves and talk about ourselves, whether we're with other people or in our own minds, that can also uh, promote connection in that way. And at the same time, right, sometimes, like, I just want to shout, like, I'm a vegan, I'm a feminist, I'm a socialist, like, and I just want that connection and to share, a re I, I have a deep need for shared reality, that's another big uh, need in nonviolent communication with other people who like who will feel me when I shout that word and they say yeah me too and we high five and then we squeeze friends right <laughs> so, and like sometimes that I need to meet that need right so it, it, there's there's whatever needs are alive in us and whatever strategies that's the, that's the whole thing is all we ever say are please and thank you and everything that we say and do is to meet a need and that's the whole game and that's the work, is trying to meet the needs the most efficient way we possibly can. Can I add something? Please. Um, so I think the people are most connected to their needs are the people that are going to show more <coughs> love and peace and be more aware of the other people's needs. So uh, it's good to be aware of your needs. Totally, yeah. Because we cannot... We cannot connect to our own needs without also opening the connection to other people's needs. And so once, the, and, the, and that's good practice. So the more I practice connecting to your needs, the more I practice connecting to mine. The more I practice connecting to my needs, the more I practice connecting to yours. And so then the more, the deeper that connection is, the more that I can better honor everyone's needs in question. And it's not going to be perfect. Sometimes I'll fuck up. But then the part of the work is, receiving the feedback so that I can better honor needs as uh, those conflicts come. And there, we're always in conflict, right? Right now, there are, you're all experiencing conflicts of like, I need to stretch, I need food, I need like movement, right? They, like every, our needs are always changing and alive and, uh, and, and on the constant move. So that's just always happening. So then, I'm, I'm here if y'all want to talk and ask questions, uh, but like, this, this has been class, thank you. And, thank you. Uh, yeah. And I'll send out resources on any of those things or anything. <laughs>